Right, so this lesson is on Muhammad and the foundations of Islam. And this is part two of a six-part series on the rise and spread of Islam. Remember to keep using your SPICE uh, graphic organizer or codes to make sense out of things because um, there's a lot of information to take in. All right, so you know, let's look at Arabia. You know, and Arabia at this time is kind of between two worlds. You know, there's increasing trade between the uh, Byzantine Empire, the, the former Eastern Roman Empire, and the Persian Empire, which at this time is being ruled by the Sassanid dynasty. You know, and this whole, this is all, remember, the old Silk Roads that head out towards China. Um, and so, you know, Northern Arabia is right on this trade network and, and able to contribute to this exchange. I mean, the Bedouins knew the desert very well and knew how to get across the toughest areas. Also, as I've said, there's a lot of wealth coming up from East Africa and across the Indian Ocean. So this is a key crossroads of, of wealth at this time period. And, you know, at, in Muhammad's day, you have some clans becoming very, very wealthy and very successful, where other clans just kind of being left in the dust, so to speak. And so we get these growing divisions of wealth, which bothered Muhammad in the same way that they bothered Jesus and the Buddha. Um, you know, anytime you get civilizations where you have very, very rich and very, very poor, it's a nasty mix. I mean, it's, it's matches and gasoline at that point. Um, you know, and also Arabia was influenced by the great monotheisms. Remember, mono meaning one, theos meaning God. And of course, I'm talking about Christianity and Judaism um, had a big influence on Arabia. But, but then again, you also have this Bedouin culture, which is polytheistic and, and wild. I mean, I almost compare the Bedouins to like, you know, cowboys or I mean, they're just tough horse people, warriors, pride, feud. Um, you know, so it's just interesting mix. I mean, Arabia really is at the crossroads at this point. And so into this historical backdrop comes Muhammad. And he's born in 570 CE. And his, his family were, they were Bedouin traders. His father died before he was born. And his mother died when he was very young. So he's an, essentially an orphan uh, from a very young age, raised by his uncle and his grandfather who were traders and by all accounts, very wise and supportive men. And uh, Muhammad was exposed to Christians and Jews on caravans to Syria. Now, if we could step back and take a look at, you know, this area, once again, these, these caravans are going up along the coastal range into Syria, which would have taken them right through the Holy Land, um, you know, and so lots of exposure from Muhammad in those early travels. Remember, that connection between trade and religion is so important in this period of world history. And so, you know, Muhammad was a trader in Mecca in his adolescence and early 20s. And like I said, he saw that growing division between rich and poor and just the nastiness between clans. You know, and he had come from poverty and orphanage in being orphaned in his childhood. And so a lot of these things just kind of combined to give him this vision of unity for his people. He wanted to see the Bedouins, the Arabs, you know, pulled together. Um, you know, and this was at a time where he was becoming very wealthy. I mean, he was a successful trader, um, but he was dissatisfied with his wealth. He was unhappy in the same way that the Buddha was. And so, you know, big change for him to, you know, to go through. And so, you know, he starts to, in his, I, I believe, later 20s, starts to retreat to the, the mountains outside of Mecca, and as, as Islamic mythology goes, the angel Gabriel, angel Gabriel uh, uh, commanded him to recite. Um, and that's what came out of that was the Quran. Just at, at the command of, of God's angel, you know, Muhammad just starts pouring out all the verses uh, of the Quran, and that's where it comes from. So here, you know, this is a revealed religion. You know, to reveal means to show. Uh, in the sense of like prophecy. And that's what the Muslims consider Muhammad is as a prophet. Um, you know, he's not the son of God um, like, like the Jesus, like, like the Christians believe Jesus is, was. Um, you know, he's a prophet more along the lines of, of Moses or Abraham. 
And so, you know, he starts off by preaching to his clan, but then it grows from there. There's something in his message that really spoke to the people of his day. And eventually, and in here again, we see just, you know, kind of the similarities to Christianity and Buddhism. The Umiyads, who, as you know, were a very powerful clan in, uh, you know, Mecca, started to be threatened by this. I mean, Muhammad is preaching that there is only one God and, and he is Allah and, you know, the people should turn away from these local tribal gods and these local shrines. That's a threat to Umayyad dominance. Um, you know, they're traitors, but they're also, you know, have religious control in Mecca. And so he's targeted for assassination, you know, typical thing, right? As soon as you tell people to love one another and be peaceful and charitable and good, someone wants to kill you, um, right? Just, just ask, ask Dr. King, right? So, you know, Muhammad flees to Medina, the other great city in that region. And this was known as the Hijira, and I'm probably not pronouncing that very well, but it's just kind of this journey. Uh, and, and this is really, for Muslims, this is the beginning of Muslim history, right? If you remember back to the periodization lesson that I gave you at the beginning of this course, um, you know, the Muslims date all of world history to this time, to this moment when Muhammad flees to Medina. You know, and in Medina, he was greeted as a hero, and there he just grew in power and influence. Like I said, there was something about this message that really appealed to the Arabs. You know, so out of Medina, Islam is born. This is where the Muslim, I mean, remember, Muslims are the people who follow Muhammad and the Quran. Islam is the name of the religion. And these Muslims would raid Meccan caravans and continued to create converts. Um, in fact, when Muhammad re returned to Mecca after his time at Medina, he brought 10,000 converts with him, which in that day and age is a huge population of people. Um, and for the, for the Bedouin Arabs, this spoke to the power of Allah. I mean, you got to remember that at this time period, you know, people really see things like, well, if you win, if you win a battle or if you're financially successful, it's God's will. So therefore, being successful in battle is evidence that God holds you as a special person. Um, and that's really the way Muhammad was seen as, as, a favored, as favored by his people. All right, so let's turn now to the characteristics of Islam itself, which, as I said, Islam is the name of the religion. You know, one of the big defining characteristics is that idea of the Ummah, which is the community of believers that all Muslims everywhere are equal, that they're equal in the eyes of Allah. Sounds very much like Christian and Buddhist thought, right? That we're all equal as opposed to being locked into these hierarchies like Hinduism has or like the Bedouins were struggling with at this time period. Uh, Islam has no priests or saints. There's only one God. There's only one true prophet. Interestingly enough, though, the, the Muslims really respected the Jewish and Christian prophets. Uh, the Muslims view Jesus as an important prophet, as well as Moses and Abraham. Like the Jews, the Muslims don't think that Jesus is the Son of God or anything you know, more than just a great prophet. Um, but, uh, you know, Muhammad is very much the one true prophet. Um, you know, the Muslims really were looking for a direct link from man to God. And you got to remember that the, I'm going to keep using this term God, which for Christians kind of makes, uh, might seem a little bit strange, right? The term Allah just means the God. That's it, right? And this is the God of Abraham. Um, and so this is an Abrahamic religion, just like uh, Christianity and Judaism. Um, all three religions, mythologies agree all the way up to the point of the life of Abraham. So all the Garden of Eden stuff, all the Satan stuff, all the Noah's flood stuff, all that's the same for all three religions up to the point of Abraham. And then there's a split. Um, you know, it's very interesting. It, one wonders why these religions don't get along better than they do. Uh, <laughs> You know, and here are the characteristics of Islam as well. You know, the big thing is these so-called five pillars of Islam. The first is the confession, right? There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. 
Um, Muslims are to pray towards Mecca five times a day. They are to fast during the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is a month on the uh, Muslim calendar. So no eating or drinking anything from sunup to sundown. Uh, the importance of zakat, which is just charity, giving money to the poor. And all Muslims who are healthy and can afford to are supposed to make the pilgrimage to Mecca once in their life to go to the Kaaba, which you know is this ancient site here. You can see it. And these are all people, right? I mean, can you imagine? It makes the Super Bowl look like nothing. Right? Uh, and so like I said, you know, this idea of the Ummah, Right, that this monotheism created unity and egalitarianism in the eyes of God. Egalitarian, right, the root word there is equal. We are all equal in the eyes of God. You know, and, and Muhammad wanted this unity and he inspired a very powerful culture. And so you get the mix of this very energetic monotheistic religion with that Bedouin toughness and infighting that is then directed outwards on the world, right? I mean, the, the Bedouins spent centuries really becoming a very tough people by fighting each other. And then once they turned their attention on the rest of the world, no one else was that tough. No one could stop them. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.